Just over 130 years ago, in the summer of 1886, a North Meath farmer by the name of Owen Smith trudged across the marshy ground southwest of the village of Nobber to a place known by locals as the island. As the sharp-eyed among you will no doubt have spotted, strictly speaking, this wasn't an island, more a peninsula jutting out into a small lake called Moina Loch, or locally pronounced Munya Loch. Similarly, despite its name, most of Munya Loch, including the island, is not actually in the townland of Munya, but in the neighbouring Britis, as you can see on this 19th century map. In any case, Owen Smith and others used to come to the island to fish in the small dark pool that was and is Munyalak. But on this occasion, in the summer of 1886, Smith's motivation wasn't fishing. You see, he'd been reading a newly published book by Colonel Wood, Will, William Gregory Wood Martin on the lake dwellings of Ireland. And in that book, Smith saw things he recognised from previous trips to the island probably when digging for worms or pulling up timber for a fire or a shelter or something like that. So this time, Smith came back with a spade and a bag. He knew exactly where to dig, and it wasn't long before he had uncovered a grinding stone, a fragment of a jet bracelet, a corroded iron object, a bone scoop, a hammer stone, a flint knife, and a stone ingot mold. He packaged them up and sent them with a covering letter to Wood Martin who had them exhibited the following year in Dublin at a general meeting of the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland. Judging by Smith's description and by the range of artifacts in the parcel, Wood Martin, correctly as it turned out, concluded that his informant had found the remains of a Cranogue or an artificial island, a monument type generally dated to the early Middle Ages. Here we see a Cranogue reconstruction at Craganowen in County Clare, and despite some artistic license, particularly around the entranceway, this gives a fairly good impression of what a site like Munya might have looked like in, say, the 8th century. Anyway, the Nobber finds were acquired by the National Museum of Ireland in 1888, and Wood Martin then approached the Royal Irish Academy for a grant in aid of the exploration of the newly discovered Cranogue site in the county of Meath. In February 1888, he was awarded £10 for this purpose, and the following November, he presented to the Academy a paper on his findings. It appears that a large hearth with, a, with an accumulation of ashes almost a metre thick was uncovered, together with a range of objects, including an iron cup, an iron nail, three pieces of jet, a range of flints, fragments of bronze, and five crucible sherds. Wood Martin's involvement with the site ended in 1888, and there the trail runs cold. Munyalok slipped from memory once again. Almost a century later, in 1977, the owner of the land to the southwest of Nobber decided to reclaim some of the boggy ground that had once constituted the lake bed. He bulldozed the mound, the island, and started to spread the earth across the marshy field around. In the process, large quantities of animal bones, broken quern stones, and some smaller objects were uncovered. When local archeologist, the celebrated George Ogan, was called in to inspect what had been found, he immediately recognized that these were the remains of a Cranog. Munya had been refound. A lecturer in archeology span at UCD from 1965, George had worked at Jericho and was at this time directing excavations at passage tombs in the Boyne Valley. In the course of bulldozing, a depth of almost a metre of earth had been removed over most of the Cranog, and it was only on the western side that the archaeology appeared to survive. The bulldozer had exposed a section in one area in which alternating layers of peat and gravel were evident, together with some habitation debris. Some artefacts, including a decorated bronze drinking horn terminal on the top right here, a jet bracelet fragment and pieces of quern stones for grinding grain were found in addition to a large quantity of animal bones, some of which can be seen here in the foreground. The drinking horn terminal that you see on the right here probably fitted at the end, as the name suggests, of a horn, a hollowed out animal horn that was used for drinking, probably ceremonially rather than in ordinary daily life. And that uh, terminal probably fitted, uh, I'm sorry for my crude uh, work on Photoshop, uh, but something a little bit like this. And so when the person was drinking from the cup, the, uh, the drinking horn terminal would have been on display uh, very clearly to everybody gathered around. 
Now, as we know, Irish archaeology and indeed Irish archaeologists move very slowly. And because the full extent and significance of the site was not realized at first in 1977, it was almost three years before a proper archaeological excavation was undertaken. The Cranog was so badly damaged, it was estimated that one month of excavation would be plenty to record what was left. The obvious person to lead the excavation was George Ogan, but he was still directing the excavations at Nauth, and he'd recently become professor and head of the Department of Archaeology at UCD. George had a promising assistant at Nauth, however. And so he seconded his 25-year-old protege to lead the rescue dig at Munya. A graduate of UCD, John Bradley lectured in archaeology there until 1996, when he joined the Department of History in Maynooth University, or NUI Maynooth as it was then. Sadly, John passed away all too early, six years ago this week, the day after tomorrow, in fact. Every part of this paper I'm presenting today, this afternoon, builds on work done by John, and I am greatly indebted to him. In the words of someone far more eloquent than I could ever be, if we have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And so it was, the four week dig with John at the helm took place in the summer of 1980, but it was soon realized that this would not be enough. You see, Cranogues are like icebergs, nine tenths can lie below the surface. And thankfully, far more had survived the bulldozer than anyone had dared to imagine. Combined with this, the challenging nature of a wetland site, a very high water table, frequent inundations and unstable ground, and you have all the ingredients for a prolonged and laborious and yet highly rewarding excavation. The excavation was a lot less high tech than it might be nowadays. The closest thing we had to a drone was the Thursday evening lectures by visiting academics. This is John on the top of a ladder taking what would loosely be termed aerial photographs. A further season of fieldwork took place in 1981 and 1982 and 1983, throughout the 1980s in fact, and well into the 90s, 14 seasons in all. The excavation team was made up primarily of UCD archaeology students and local volunteers and labourers. It was licensed by the National Museum and the National Monument Service and funded, again as it happens, for the second time by the Royal Irish Academy, for whom it had become a flagship project. Over the years, many individuals who would go on to hold the most senior offices in Irish archaeology, in universities, museums, the civil service, and the private sector, cut their teeth troweling back the years at Munyalak. It's even said, I've heard, that a number of romantic relationships blossomed on site, and several marriages owe their origins to encounters here in the rolling hills of North Meath. John was known to claim that when it came to marriages, Munya had a higher success rate than even Scylla Black on Blind Date. My own association with Munya Lock began as a UCD archaeology undergrad in the early 1990s. Over a quarter of a century ago now, my first year tutor was a certain Mr. Bradley. The rest, as they say, is archaeology. I served a short apprenticeship as a volunteer, became a supervisor in 1996 and was assistant director of the excavations from 1997. When we pulled the covers over the site at the end of the 98 season, we fully expected to be back on site the following summer. But for reasons that I've never fully been uh, clear about, we never did go back. A few years ago, the photo that you can see here was posted on Facebook and inevitably with social media, various comments were made about it. The one that sticks in my mind was the cheeky but perhaps prescient observation by Chris Corlett that one day, Michael, this will all be yours. I still smile at the thought of, uh, of that. Ah yes, uh, in a photo taken on a sunnier day that year, here is Chris Corlett supervising, among others, Carl Brady and Ellie Larson, etc. That might be a youthful me there somewhere as well, writing on Carl's back. I propose to outline some of the findings from the excavations, but first a little about the site itself and its location. Munyalok lies just over 400 metres southwest of Nobber, surrounded by a drumlin landscape of rich pasturelands. 
The surviving pool, which is about 200 meters long by about 60 meters wide, is all that remains of a once much larger lake that was drained perhaps in the early 19th century. That lake was really just an expanse of the River Dee, which following the drainage works now flows in a straight man-made channel through the center of the old lake bed. If you look carefully at the red dot for Munya Lock uh, in the middle of this map, you'll see that much of the lake bed remains marshy all year round and simply by using contour data we can estimate the area previously covered by the lake, as you'll see here. One possible derivation of the place name Munya or Moina is Mawnenok, the marshy plain. The lake itself frequently reforms in these marshy fields after heavy winter rains. I'm grateful to Kevin Weldon, Nobber's second most famous archaeologist, for giving me these excellent photos he took after heavy rainfall in late 2015, in December, I see at the bottom of those photographs. They give a, a taste of the landscape and a good idea of the extent of the lake prior to drainage. And I'll show you a few more just now. The site of Munya Lock and the Cronog site is to the top right of the flooded area in this picture. And you can see it a little bit more closely uh, in this one just in the distance in the forestry to the top right. During that preliminary 1980 excavation, it became clear that while the bulldozer had remo removed or damaged the uppermost layers, evidence of a number of activity phases survived, including the construction levels of the Cranog itself and several stages of habitation. An additional surprise was the, the discovery of several layers of prehistoric activity beneath the Cranog levels. The careful removal of the bulldozer spoil revealed that the archaeological layering had been sliced in the way a knife cuts through an onion, simultaneously exposing a number of layers. This explained the apparent anomaly of diagnostically prehistoric artifacts scattered among the disturbed early medieval layers in 1977. It took many years to successfully disentangle these layers, and we could argue that that disentangling is still happening. And ultimately, four major cultural phases were distinguished. These belong to the early medieval period, the late Bronze Age, the early to middle Bronze Age, and the Mesolithic. There's also a small later medieval horizon, and recent research suggests that Neolithic activity at the site was more multifaceted than previously appreciated. The location of the site next to the lake is clear in this aerial photograph. And if we virtually flood the area again, based on contour information and the evidence of the 19th century map we saw earlier, we can see how the site was on a peninsula where Owen Smith used to fish and had formed an island in the past. It makes a lot of sense now where the site was located. Con Brogan's aerial view of the site shows the layout of the excavation in four meter by four meter squares on a north-south alignment with one meter wide balks or walkways between the cuttings and you can see how close the site was to the lake. And this general plan of the site from 1989 shows how complex it was in terms of having multiple layers and time periods exposed simultaneously. Now, this also gives me an opportunity to draw your attention to one of the strands of work we're currently engaged in, and that is the digitization of the hundreds of site plans, section drawings, etc. So we're converting a drawing like this on screen now to this doesn't look very different, but this painstaking task is being carried out by Sarah Nyland and it's funded by the Royal Irish Academy and the National Monuments Service. This process is facilitating the ongoing research and will provide a suite of key illustrations for the final publication. The initial human occupation of the site commenced in the centuries immediately before about 4000 BC when a community of Mesolithic hunter-gatherers constructed a series of platforms in the lake, possibly on top of naturally occurring knolls or islets. The platforms were about 60 metres from the shore, a position that would have been attractive in terms of security as well as affording excellent opportunities for fishing and fowling. Two of these platforms were excavated. Both were sub-rectangular and would have risen about 75 centimetres above the lake water. On the shore side, the water would have been shallow, but to the north where the lake survives, the water dropped steeply, suggesting that the position had been chosen carefully. There were at least three levels of occupation, each separated by thin layers of lake mud, suggesting that the site was abandoned and returned to periodically. 
two pits and 56 post holes were identified here. Some of the post holes formed a C shape that may represent a shelter or windbreak as suggested in this reconstruction here, or even part of a hut. A charcoal sample from the uppermost occupation level of one of the platforms yielded a radiocarbon date centering on about 4,200 BC, about 6,000 years ago. Based on discussions with the archeologists, in 1998, Maynooth history postgrad Eric Kemp did a series of reconstruction drawings of what the Mesolithic settlement could have looked like. Now, this was the early days of digital reconstruction over 20 years ago, but despite a number of clear anomalies here, Eric's work is nonetheless an interesting perspective on what Mesolithic Munyalak might have been like. Approximately 2,000 stone artifacts were recovered from the Mesolithic levels, mostly flint and chert. These are currently being studied by Graham Warren and Martha Ravel at UCD, and we're excitedly awaiting a final report on this in the coming weeks. No pressure, guys. As well as the lithics, one bone point was found, and the sole wooden object was an elongated, pointed, uh, and burnt object, uh, burnt at both ends. Several axe heads, nine spearheads of slaty sandstone, and several rough outs were present. Similar spearheads were known from uh, are known from around Ireland before this. Oops. Uh, Similar spearheads are known from around Ireland before this, and several more were found in, um, in museum collections after the Munya ones had been found. This was the first time, however, that they'd been found uh, in a sealed late Mesolithic context, as far as I'm aware. There are about 100 of these uh, spearheads known, these slaty spearheads known, as you can see on the, in the drawing on the right here. And sometimes in the literature, they're in, actually referred to as Moina points or Munya points. The sample of animal bones from the Mesolithic levels was quite small, but they were well preserved. At least one young hare, one older bear, one otter and four wild pigs were represented. Cut marks on the bones indicate that the flesh had been removed, possibly with one of the sharp stone tools that were found. The position and angle of some of the cuts suggests that the tendons were being removed too. Could they have been used to tie those stone spearheads to a wooden handle, for instance? The manner in which the ends of the long bones were broken indicates that the marrow was being extracted, and it appears that the skulls were cracked open to remove the brains. This ties in with what we know from other prehistoric sites, Bone marrow and brain are both remarkably nutritious and beneficial additions to the diet. Nobody's having their tea at the moment. Perhaps you are. Of the four wild pigs represented, two were infants and two were adult males. Although it's very, a very small sample, it's possible to speculate that the Mesolithic inhabitants of Munyalok were deliberately avoiding hunting adult females in the knowledge that this would help to preserve future food supplies and other raw materials. Ongoing research on these remains by Jonathan Small at Queen's University in Belfast is using isotopic analysis to provide information on the diet and geographical origins and range of the pigs. So far, the evidence suggests that most of the pigs were hunted locally, but one came from much further away. Again, this is ongoing research. We haven't got full results of it yet, but it sounds very interesting so far. With the introduction of farming to Ireland in the years after 4000 BC, the hunter-gatherer-fisher lifestyle was gradually replaced. Neolithic farmers exploited the landscape in a different way to their predecessors, deriving their food not so much from fish and fowl, but more from cultivating the land and raising stock. As I mentioned, the nature of Neolithic activity is being revealed by ongoing work by Graham and Martha, but here I'd like to mention uh, one hoard or cache of over 170 flints that was found by Mark Mullally, carefully arranged and buried in shallow water close to the Mesolithic platforms. The careful arrangement of the flints indicates that they were deposited deliberately. The hoard has been examined by Farina Sternke, who identified mostly flakes, several blades, and some debitage. There were three hollow and concave scrapers and four burins of middle Neolithic date. These were the tools for wood and bone working. From microscopic analysis, Farina found evidence for at least two different nappers, a skilled napper and a novice. 
And for any non-archaeologists out there, the napping I'm referring to is not the activity that you're probably engaged in now, but the shaping of stone, typically flint, by striking it so as to make a tool or a weapon or a utensil. From the time of the Mesolithic occupation of the site, the climate appears to have become gradually wetter. By about 2000 BC, the level of the lake waters had risen considerably, and the Mesolithic surface was covered by a layer of brown open water mud, varying in thickness from 10 to 60 centimeters. Around 1900 BC, however, there was a period of climatic improvement. Areas that had formerly been wet dried out and were available once more for occupation. We're now in the early Bronze Age. In this period, the new tenants of the site at Munya appeared to have deposited a spread of timber and stone, stone on the dry lake water mud. This material formed the foundation for a habitation layer that contained the remains of two circular houses of early Bronze Age date. These had been built with posts and wattles, and the uh, holes left by the posts uh, are visible on screen here of the two houses, house one on the right and house two on the left. In terms of house one, the occupation layer consisting of lenses of charcoal, peat and brushwood reached a maximum thickness of 15 centimetres. The artefacts recovered included sherds of decorated cordoned pottery, which was from mainly from domestic urns, rounded scrapers, barbed and tanged arrowheads, pointed bone objects, rubbing stones and fragments of saddle querns. A radiocarbon uh, determination of circa 1900 to 1700 BC was obtained from these levels. After this time, the site was once again abandoned, probably due to cl uh, climatic deterioration and rising waters. By about 890 BC, during the Late Bronze Age, the site dried out once more and became, a, became suitable for settlement again. And two stages of activity were identified during the Late Bronze Age. The first consisted of four stone spread, whose function was probably to provide firm ground on the exposed lake mud. In addition, there were two open air hearths and the remains of a circular structure about six and a half meters across with a hearth placed slightly off center. Despite the presence of a hearth and the associated ash spills, this structure had no occupation layer and it does not appear to have been used as a house, strictly speaking. Finds from this level included two quern stones, sherds of coarse pottery, a bone spindle whirl. A bronze hair ring that we found consists of a bronze sheeting placed over a lead core. The terminals are decorated with incised crisscross lines. That incidentally is the hair ring on the left of the image you can see here now. So they were decorated with incised crisscross lines set within a rectangular panel. Hair rings have been found on several late Bronze Age settlement sites, and George Ogan has suggested that they functioned as status symbols, indicating that the wearer was perhaps a person of rank or at least a person of local significance. This level, the late Bronze Age level, was subsequently covered by a layer of stones mixed with charcoal and debris, radiocarbon dated to 890 to 790 BC. This layer produced animal bones and a wide range of artifacts, mostly domestic in function. There were weapons, tools, and jewellery of bronze, as well as objects of glass, amber, lignite, shale, bone, antler, and stone. Several hundred sherds of coarse pottery were recovered, but these seem to derive from just a few individual pots. They are currently being studied by Helen Roach and Owen Grogan at Maynooth University. The stone spindle whirls, six rubbing stones, two burnishers, and fragments of over 20 saddle querns were also found. Such a high number of quern stones is remarkable. The ornaments and bronzes indicate that the inhabitants were of high status. The amber is not native to Ireland and seems to have been imported from the Baltic, some 2,000 kilometers away. It was almost certainly a prestige item. It's the spearheads, however, that provide the clearest indication that the Munya dwellers were people of some standing. Firstly, they hint at the presence of warriors or hunters, and by this period, the two were possibly synonymous, while their casual loss apparently reflects the affluence of the owners. For reasons unknown to us now, the site was abandoned again around 790 BC. A thin layer of open water mud accumulated naturally in the vicinity of the knolls on which the prehistoric activity had been focused. 
Since the mud did not cover them entirely, however, it would appear that they still formed shallows, and it was probably this factor that attracted the Cranog builders, probably in the 7th century AD. Excavation revealed that the early medieval Cranog was occupied for approximately 200 years, and a series of six habitation phases were present. The exact size and shape of the Cranog varied from generation to generation, but in general terms, it occupied an oval area measuring about 40 metres east-west by about 32 metres north-south. Outside the Cranog, timber piles had been driven into the ground and on the westward side, these extended for a distance of at least 10 metres. Advantage was taken of the natural knolls by reclaiming the ground around them. The substructure of the Cranod consisted of stones, gravelly earth, timbers, brushwood, and large quantities of redeposited peat, retained at the perimeter, although perhaps not initially, by a timber palisade. Each of the six phases of occupation was characterized by the laying down of a thick spread of redeposited peat, which formed a building platform for the new phase. It's likely that each of these phases represented the activities of a generation or so of Cranog dwellers. Phase one and possibly phase two appears to represent pre-Cranog occupation. In other words, these levels seem to predate the formalization of the site when the enclosing timber palisade was constructed. There was a round hut, which at just over three meters in diameter is unlikely to have served as a dwelling because of its small size. Associated with the hut was a pathway of flat timbers. Some of the timbers had mortises and were evidently reused from elsewhere. The finds from the immediate vicinity of the hut included an iron shield boss, a rectangular bronze mount resembling a buckle, an iron spearhead seen here on the bottom, and also on screen here, sherds of e-ware pottery, which is a type made in France in the sixth and seventh centuries. On the subject of imported goods, on the eastern side of the site, two complete tiny glass vessels of Merovingian type and a bronze spatula for extracting the contents from these vessels were discovered. The bottles are of sixth to seventh century type, and the only other comparable example known from Ireland is from Muller Row in County Sligo, and that's the center one here. So the two on e either side here are from Munyalock. And if you look at the scale there on the right-hand side, uh, that's one centimeter. So these are tiny. These have been researched by Ed Burke, and he published them in, uh, in the Journal of the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland in 1994. Anybody interested in that can follow it up. It's available freely on JSTOR. Phase two was characterized by a group of refuse layers, but any associated structures were beyond the area excavated. Among the finds were a rim shirt of e-ware, a bronze disc pendant pin, a bronze brooch with bird's head terminals, double-sided bone combs, including the ones you can see on screen here, glass beads, and a leather shoe. Billy Sines and I have had some discussion about doing some analysis on the bone combs, but this has now been mothballed for a while due to COVID. Like the others, phase three was built upon a layer of redeposited peat, but I'm not going to go into details of that here, be death by phases on a Thursday evening. So I'll skip over phase three. The major fe uh, fe features associated with the phase four levels consisted of a roundhouse, two metalworking areas, an entrance pathway, and a series of cesspits. Hence the little slip there. The basal layer, like its counterparts in the other phases, was an extensive spread of redeposited peat. Now, the following is perhaps a somewhat dubious claim to fame, but the excavations at Munyalok uh, have revealed uh, one of the largest assemblages of early medieval coprolites ever uncovered in Ireland or Britain. And for anybody who doesn't know, coprolites are fossilized uh, feces. Initial research in Maynooth by Shoda Matthews has paved the way for further analysis by Jessica Hendy and Eleanor Green in York University later this year. Uh, we hope to discover information about diet, disease, landscape, etc., from isotopic DNA and radiocarbon analysis. I'll keep you posted on this. The York research will tie in with other, another strand of the project being undertaken by Steve Davis at UCD. 
The slide you see here shows some of Steve's analysis of early medieval samples from Munya, highlighting various insect remains associated with settlement, effluent, running water, etc. I think it's going to be really interesting when we are start, start to be able to bring all of these different strands together and build a larger picture and narrative of uh, what daily life and death would have been like uh, on Manya at any given time over the 4,000 years or so of occupation. The entranceway to phase four consisted of a series of timbers laid transversely across two parallel runners, 95 centimeters apart. As the path approached the interior, the runners were dispensed with and the timbers were placed directly on the ground. The reason for this differentiation may be that the wet conditions near the Cronog edge demanded a more substantial foundation. The, there were mortise holes in a number of timbers, but only one had a peg driven through it. The majority of the timbers were of oak and one which had five mortise holes and seems to have been reused had sufficient number of rings to be sampled dendrochronologically. Uh, and it yielded uh, a probable felling date of AD 625, confirming that it was um, a reused timber, probably from phase one or phase two. Metalworking area one was defined by a large area of charcoal, a coil built pottery vessel, baked clay, crucible shards, mold fragments, an iron stake for beating metal, sheet metal, and three motif pieces, one of stone and two of bone, one of which you can see here on screen, both of which had a triketra ornament, which you can also see here on screen with my attempt to reconstruct it. One of the funding proposals we currently have pending is for some collaboration with Brendan O'Neill to look much more closely at the evidence for metalworking across the site. A second metalworking area included a bowl furnace seen here, a stone lined area of burnt clay, a spread of compacted pebbles and a dump of metalworking debris. The bowl was carefully constructed and was set into a prepared scoop or hollow in the redeposited peat. Clay molds were the most numerous object from this phase and over 600 fragments with a total weight of over 1.7 kilos were found. All were two piece molds and about 10% were decorated. And as you can see here, there were four types of decorated clay molds um, made up of 60 individual pieces, and they were probably for uh, making brooches, mounts, studs, and other objects. Generally, only fragments of the molds were found, but the lower and most of the upper pieces of one example seen here survived, shedding useful light on the manufacturing methods. It's evident that the impression to be cast was made in wet clay that was allowed to harden. This impression is deeply impressed on the lower piece, but the upper has only a shallow outline. After the clay had hardened, the pieces were encased together in an outer slip of clay and the whole lot was fired. It could now be used for casting. On completion of the casting and the cooling of the metal, the mold was broken to extract the molded metal object. This metal object called a mount would have been used as a component in the manufacture of, for example, a shrine or brooch or other piece of high quality and high status metalwork. This was no ordinary run of the mill workshop. One mold bears the impression of a human head with bulbous eyes, arched eyebrows, a pointed nose and a slit mouth. Perhaps the most striking feature of this individual is the hair parted in the center, framing the face as it falls to terminate in a curl. Similar features can be found on a number of metalwork heads, including on the Cavan brooch, as seen here. Other finds from this level include a lump of yellow enamel, an amber bead and five amber clips, uh, chips, a bronze pin and button, two corroded iron knives, the head of a bone pin, half of an oval bone disc, two cut pieces of horn and one of antler, a whetstone, 18 flints, and over a kilo of metalworking waste. The amber, again imported from probably 2,000 kilometers away in Scandinavia, is interesting. It's remarkable to think that just 20 centimeters or so below their feet were ready-made amber beads and rings lost over a thousand years earlier, and yet they still imported from thousands of kilometers away to the exact same spot in 
North County Meath amber at almost certainly great expense. The major features of phase five were a palisade, two round houses and a furnace. The palisade was composed of trimmed oak planks placed side by side in a narrow trench. A layer of redeposited peat extended across the western part of the Cranog and formed the foundation layer on which the round houses and furnace were built. Three planks were removed for dendrochronological purposes, and these returned a felling date of AD 748, probably in the winter of that year. This gives us a fairly robust date for the beginning of this phase of activity at the site. The eastern side of the large house to the right in this picture was destroyed by the bulldozer. I think you can make that out where the post holes disappear, making this once circle into a C shape. But sufficient remained of the other sides to indicate that it had originally an external diameter of 11.2 meters. Internally, it measured 10 meters across or a little more. The house was constructed by depositing a layer of compacted gravel on top of the platform of redeposited peat. The gravel formed the foundation for the house wall, which was defined by a double row of post holes. Over 250 post holes were found within the house. Their diameter was very small, and it's likely that they formed part of internal partitions and supports for benches and bedding features. Within the house, the buildup of habitation debris averaged 12 centimetres in thickness. Included within this layer of debris were 20 ash spreads, almost all of which were rakeouts from the central hearth. Animal bones occurred throughout the layer, but there was a noticeable concentration in the vicinity of the hearths. The habitation layer yielded a wide range of objects of metal, bone, stone, glass, jet, and other materials. The bronze drinking horn terminal that was found prior to excavation and mentioned earlier seems to have derived from this level. It's in the form of a stylized animal's head with an elongated snout from which the tongue projects to terminate in a small spiral. The eyes are formed with insets of blue glass and behind them the ears are defined by a ridge. A very similar item was found at Lismore in County Waterford and now resides in the British Museum in London. Very little of phase six, the uppermost phase, survived the bulldozing activity in 1977. The remains consisted of an oak palisade, parts of a foundation layer of redeposited peat, and a solitary charcoal spread. At one point, fragmentary wattles were found interwoven between the posts, indicating that the palisade was composed of posts and wattles above the waterline. When complete, it would have enclosed an area roughly 36 to 40 meters across. You can see here both the palisade from phase six marked by the orange line arrow and the tips of the phase five palisade that are also visible. Finds from this level included three tanged iron knives, two complete crucibles and sherds of eight others, part of a rotary quernstone, the terminal tooth plate of a bone comb, half a blue glass bead, a rough chunk of amber drilled for threading, and four jet bracelet fragments. A tiny piece of finely crafted gold filigree was also found. It was probably intended as a panel on a brooch or something like that, and you can see it illustrated on screen here. Stylistically, it belongs in the first half of the ninth century, probably around 810 or so. And it is tiny. Again, have a look at the scale. That's one centimeter. This entire piece is less than a centimeter across. It's probably smaller than your fingernail. And yet it has eight spirals of gold set. And these are formed from three twisted tiny pieces of wire. Even with our own magnifying glasses and good eyes, good eyeglasses in the 21st century, it's difficult to make out some of the detail. Imagine trying to work on something like this uh, over a thousand years ago. And in terms of the jet and lignite from the site, some initial research has been carried out by Michelle Hussey at Manu University, and we hope to work with Paul Stevens on further analysis once the current travel restrictions have been lifted. So that's unfortunately another aspect of the project that is on hold just at the moment, but we'll get back to it in due course. So what can we conclude then about the early medieval chronog at Manialoc? 
Well, based on the assumption that each phase represents one generation and with a start date for phase five of about AD 748, it can be suggested that occupation on the site stretched from about 620 to roughly 810. This is supported by dendrochronological date of 625 for the reused timber in phase four entranceway. The theory of continuity of occupation into the ninth century is supported by the discovery of that small piece of gold filigree. The presence of six occupation levels indicates periodic rebuilding, a feature that has been recorded on other Cranog excavations. Round houses are also well evidenced from the other early medieval contexts, but the size of the Munyalok phase five house is exceptional. And basing his research on the early Irish law tracts, Chris Lynn suggested that it was the residence of a king or senior aristocrat. This ties in well with research by Adele Vranok, which indicates that Munya is the Loch de Mundoc associated with the Mugdorne during the seventh and eighth centuries. It is no surprise then that the authors of the early medieval archeology span project, EMAP, some of whom are present here today, chose to illustrate the Munya house on the spine of their groundbreaking monograph. One of the points highlighted by this book is the multifarious usages of Cranogs and Munyalok exemplifies many of uh, those mentioned in the book. The metalworking uh, provides significant insight into the economy of the Cranog and it was an important um, activity in every phase. By and large, however, the evidence is for fine metalworking rather than blacksmithing. <clears throat> Can you kick that person out? The clay mold fragments from the form the largest collection known from any Irish site and indicate that Munya was an important workshop. Small chips of amber were found with the molds together with the occurrence of enamel uh, and gold. Sorry the, about that, guys. I have no idea what is happening. Um, I think it's Ali and Katie. Oh, there, I think they've gone. Maybe not. Kick them out. Yeah, it's Ali and Katie. Is it little kids as well, presumes it? Ali, Ali and Katie? Yeah. I have... I think they're gone. It might be if yeah. you're doing this through Google Drive or Google On... that it's actually someone on a different computer going into that Google Doc and drawing in it that way. It might not be someone in the Zoom. Anyway. I think they've left the... Con our, our, yeah, I can't see them. Our, I can't see them. Oh, dear, a second ago. They've left. Oh, mm -hmm. this is okay. annoying. Oh. <laughs> My how on earth? Uh, how do we get rid of that? I have no idea. Can oh you stop? God. Maybe can you stop your uh, screen share and then we can start your screen share again? Sure. Okay. Oh my god. Oh, I'm so sorry, guys. I have no idea what happened there. I think it's something else. Because we uh, we send the link only to people who asked for that. It wasn't shared anywhere online. So this is... Oh, this Mariel has said the moderator can turn off attendee note annotation in your participants' options. Whoever's in charge, if you go to uh, participants and you should get some options, and annotation is in that and you can turn it off for attendees. Annotation. Mm. Typical. I, oh, I can't see it anyway. Oh. oh, I'm so sorry, guys. Mm. It's somebody on a pad. Yeah. I, I quickly Googled there, and yeah. if you go to the screen share menu, you, you uh -huh. will be able to find disable attendee annotations. So advised multiple who can share I see disable annotation there. I seem to have access that to that as well, Michaela, but I, you can't seem to undo what's there. 
uh, enable annotation for this, hide names of annotators, hide video panel, hide floating meeting controls, optimize screen sharing for video clip or leave. Oh, I didn't do it on mom's computer. Oh my God. I, I thought it was just on my computer. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. And um, how we can get rid of it. Um, I will I'm glad I'm not the only one who can see it. I will try to share my screen. Uh, something. And Michael, can you? And then well, that's better. Uh, and then you share your screen. Okay. Oh, it's saying only one participant can oh, share at the time. Yeah, I have to. Now I have to uh, unshare now. Have you unshared yours? Uh, I have. Yeah. Could have been worse. We could have been Zoom bombed. <laughs> uh, O'Sullivan, I know it's just you trying to stop me. <laughs> What's that? Oh, it's perfect. He has his kids in the other room. Yay. Oh. oh, hang on. Is it gone now? It's gone now. <laughs> okay, I'm so glad, guys. I'm so sorry about it. That's I was just thinking what, what's going on. I was trying to. I'm going to I'm going to try and share again. It, see, it was there for a moment. At least I could see it for a moment. It's unshared now. It's not sharing now. Yeah, come in. Yes, you're back. Perfect. What do you see? We see Aiden's uh, O'Sullivan's book. Ah, Aiden. Aiden, <laughs> you did O'Sullivan's book. We see the PowerPoint slide. You grant the Bible. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, the Bible. Um, <coughs> very good. It's no surprise then that Aiden chose to photobomb this presentation with a cover of his and Finbar and Thomas and Lorcan's uh, groundbreaking uh, book. And it's probably no surprise then also uh, that uh, they, sorry, I have to go back there for a sec, that they chose to uh, show the Munilock House on the spine of this book. Um, the claim old fragments are the largest collection known from any Irish site and indicate that Munya was an important workshop. Small chips of amber were found with the moulds together with the occurrence of enamel, gold wire, and small ingots of bronze and gold. These suggest that fine jewellery was manufactured here. Indeed, while not suggesting that they were manufactured at Munya, I think it's fair to say that every tool, material, and component required to produce something of the prestige and achievement of, say, the tar brooch was present in the Munya assemblage. And they date to the same period and are from the same part of the country. Who knows? And so if we were able to travel back in time by about 1300 years, and we were to walk across the marshy landscape south of Nobber in the year 700, much like Owen Smith did in 1886, what would it be like we would probably see smoke rising from fires and furnaces. We might hear the crackling of fires and the sounds of metal workers hammering and banging. We'd probably hear farm animals and maybe a dog barking, as well as human voices carrying on the breeze. And it might look something like this in the image on screen. Incidentally, the ranging rod in the foreground is for a class on how not to use a ranging rod correctly, or an exposition on near versus far away. Um, the house might have looked something a little like this one on the reconstructed Cranogue at the Irish National Heritage Park in Ferry Carrig in Wexford. And that's because the reconstruction of this house is based on the one at Munyalock. And you might indeed recognize the gentleman in the photo. In 2013, they decided to replace the Crown Oak at the Irish National Heritage Park as the roofs were deteriorating and timbers were rotting. In their original, they hadn't managed to build a roundhouse 11 metres across because they simply couldn't do it, couldn't work out how to do it without a central post and Munya didn't have a central post. But in 2013, they did manage to do it. Much like Munya Lock then, the 20th century Crown Oak at Ferry Carrig seems to have had a lifespan of about 30 years or one generation. And so with a similar climate, it seems that the roof, the timbers, the walls needed to be replaced after about 30 years. And this wasn't a planned uh, project, but I think it's very interesting to observe that and to observe also how they uh, went about reconstructing it just 
a, lot, uh, a few years ago. So that's Munya Lock in the past, and this on screen here is Munya in the present, a little overgrown, but still there, like many of us. And what about Munya in the future then? What commenced in 1980 as a four week excavation is 40 years later, still not finished. Over the years, John produced a number of reports and published many articles about the findings at Munya, but the main excavation report remains incomplete and unpublished. When John moved to Maynooth from UCD in 1996, the Munya archive came with him. Maynooth took responsibility for housing the archive and administering the substantial research grants provided by the Royal Irish Academy. Students from the department worked on the excavation and afterwards were involved in post-excavation tasks. When John passed away in November 2014, the excavation was incomplete and unpublished. The archive, including over 8,000 artifacts, 20 boxes of soil samples, 50 notebooks, 40 ring binders, and hundreds of plans, drawings, sketches, and photographs is still housed on campus. We have now re-established formally the Munya Lock project under the auspices of the Department of History at Maynooth. It's a cross-disciplinary inter-institutional project led by Maynooth in collaboration with UCD and other partners with external funding coming primarily from the Royal Irish Academy who see this as a significant legacy project after all, they did start funding it over 130 years ago in 1888 with a £10 grant to William Wood Martin, as well as funding from Meath County Council and other partners, which, for which I am very grateful. We've convened a steering committee and their positive response, goodwill and support have been overwhelming. We've completed a preliminary assessment of the archive, including extent and condition, what has been completed, what remains to be done and the priorities for future work. While the core collaboration is between Maynooth and UCD, we've established key partnerships with Queen's University in Belfast, York University, as you've heard, and a range of other colleagues and institutions. I mentioned some aspects of these ongoing projects earlier. There remains a lot to do in terms of the archive itself and preparing it to go to the National Museum of Ireland and the preparation and publication of the final excavation report. This is a hugely significant excavation reflected in the enthusiasm of so many major academic, cultural and governmental bodies. And its importance will become more widely realized as the project develops. There will be teaching and learning opportunities for students and postdoctoral fellows, funding opportunities, work experience, practical training, conference and media exposure. There is a clear community aspect to the project and Nobber is fortunate to have a dynamic local heritage group and indeed the George Ogan Heritage and Community Center. In due course, I hope, the publication will be a fitting and appropriate memorial to the site and just as importantly, if not more so, to the man who knew it best, our late friend, John Bradley. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me and for those of you who have managed to stay the duration. That was wonderful, Jim. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, sorry about... Uh, the thingy uh, with oh that's uh, okay that's okay the are... I was trying to figure out that I I just couldn't I was I Colleges almost had a heart attack so uh, my apologies uh, I want to uh, thank to everybody who came uh, and join us uh, for this fantastic lecture uh, I want to thank to uh, Michael uh, it was it was fascinating. Uh, and uh, your finish uh, about uh, John Bradley, it was just beautiful. Um, so uh, we have uh, some time uh, for questions. So if you if you wish, oh, I see I have a lot of messages here. Uh, if you see, uh, if, if you want, you can just unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, it's entirely up, up to you. So, yeah, I actually, before someone asks, um, I wanted to ask about the bare bone um, because I'm not sure uh, you were saying it's from the Mesolithic uh, layer, isn't it? Yes, apparently. Now we are embarking on a new se uh, sequence of, of radiocarbon dates for this. So it's dated to the Mesolithic, not because it ha we have a date for the actual bone itself, which we are going to do, but because it was found apparently in a context dated otherwise to the Mesolithic. But as you know, the site was badly damaged by the bulldozer. So I wouldn't be 100% confident about that. Um, 
nonetheless, at the moment, until proven otherwise, that's the date that we have. Okay, perfect. Because the only other uh, bare bone, actually, which I have in mind, it's uh, the one which was found in the uh, cave, and uh, no one is uh, pretty much sure uh, about it as well, like 10,000 years old or... That, that's, that's right, as, as far as I know. Th yeah, thanks so very much. Otherwise, I, I yeah. don't know any other uh, bare bones within like uh, settlements or anything. So that yeah. was just a very interesting. Um, thanks, thanks, Emily. And so, anyone else have a question? <laughs> Could I ask one, please? And it might be for Aidan O'Sullivan rather than Michael. That little piece of gold at the end, the spirals were less than a millimeter in diameter. How could they make such tiny spirals, such tiny gold work in the 8th and 9th centuries? Are, are you, do you want to ask Aidan? Aidan yeah. might not still be there. Are you still there, Aidan? I'm still here, but I, I'm not the man to answer that. Either you, Michael, or possibly um, Brendan, if he's here. Yeah, I, I don't know. To be honest, Owen, it's a question that I ask myself regularly. And... Um, it's remarkable. And when you, you see it on screen is one thing, even with the uh, scale bar on it. But when you actually hold it in your hand, it is tiny. And you, with the naked eye, you can hardly see those uh, details. And you hold it under a magnifying glass and you can see it. And it, it's just incredible to think that that was it, that it was possible. As to the, the techniques in terms of being able to see it, being able to twist it, being able to get light sufficient to look at it, I have to say, I don't know. But it's one of the things that we do intend to, to look at with, with Brendan and others uh, once we can manage funding for that aspect of the project. Could There's I just... another, sorry, Owen, just one other, one other thing. There is a second piece. It's not quite as impressive as that, but there are two of those tiny pieces. I was just going to say that in terms of this kind of miniature, very fine work, um, the suggestion from the Bronze Age site at Overton Down in Wiltshire, uh, where there were uh, dozens of uh, gold pins less than five millimeters in length studded into the hilt of a knife. It was suggested, uh, done some research, that only a child's fingers would be small enough to manage uh, something as tiny as that. I'm thinking especially of the money work, the three twisted wires that form the filigree. It's not just a single band of gold. Uh, so maybe it was child labor back in the early medieval period as there was in the Bronze Age as well. Ali and Katie, perhaps. Yes, perhaps <laughs> the, very, the very pair. Very nice. Thanks very much for that, Owen. Uh, both Owen, uh, sorry, Owen Barade and uh, Owen Grogan. Michael can, Michael, can I ask you a question on that? I suppose. Go for it. So, so we, we saw that they've cl clearly got glass. Is there any evidence anywhere that they actually had any kind of magnifying glass? Not that I know of, although there are pieces of um, somebody else in the audience might be able to answer this better than me, but uh, there are pieces of rock crystal that can be used that, that are found on uh, in, in prehistoric levels on sites, including Munya. And when you hold them up, they do magnify what you see through them. But there's no evidence that I'm aware of that that's, for, that's what they were used for. Uh, but perhaps somebody else there, I don't know, Owen Grogan or... Um, anybody who's here might be able to answer that it, i don't think it's fantastically difficult to make the kind of um uh, spiral uh, of gold and um, it's about passing the gold cutting it really thin and then passing it through two kind of solid uh, blocks of something you can do, you can do with wood the, i think the intricacy is actually uh soldering it to the base plate of gold and that's where you need real kind of uh it's very fiddly and very difficult it's actually i think much more of a complication for uh, uh, fingers than it is for eyesight, um, and once so the, the, the spiral itself is is, is um, um, it'll just happen if you run it through uh, a couple of blocks of things, and um, yeah, so it's it's that kind of really really delicate positioning to make the shape and then to solder it on. This is this is the highly complicated part, I think. Thanks, Brendan. I know I find. With my chubby fingers, difficult to send a text message. Never mind to carry out that type of work. So, um, um, Michaela, are you still there? How are we fixed for time? I know you. I am. I'm still here. We are fine. Uh, I have few. Uh, 
I have a lot of comments. Uh, everyone says, uh, thank you, Michael. It was a brilliant lecture. Um, in a nutshell, thank you, thank you. Uh, everyone, everyone says that. But here I have a um, comment from uh, Maureen Doyle, uh, which says, Neef uh, Whitefield has done a huge amount of work on a gold uh, filigree. That's so right. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, Neve has, has looked at some of the uh, Munya material a long time ago, admittedly, and I'm sure she would like to see it again in the context of her, her own ongoing research. But uh, thanks, Maureen, for that. That's very good. Anybody who'd like to follow that up, um, look at uh, Neve Whitfield's uh, work on the insular metalwork of the early medieval period. And um, then, perfect, Michael, thank you. Then I have a question here from uh, Kevin, uh, Dylison, uh, would you like to ask it yourself or shall I read it out? I will probably read it out. So uh, I have a question. I noticed you did not mention the wooden artifact assemblage. Has there been any progress with examining this part of the archive? Yes. Uh, the only reason I didn't mention that is because it was on slides 100 and something to 120. I, I had thought about it, but it, you know, time was against me. And it's simply because it was uh, further down and I, I didn't get to it. So there's no other reason than that. Uh, there's obviously been work done, uh, including by uh, Aidan O'Sullivan, uh, who's here, and other people on the timbers and the axe marks on the timbers. Um, quite a lot of the timber went to, the, the wooden artifacts went to the National Museum for conservation. Uh, and some of them weren't, weren't looked at before that. So we hope to, again, funding permitting, uh, to have analysis done with that as well. Uh, so there has, so, some work has been done uh, and there's nothing happening at the moment, but it's in our plans, it's in our priorities for the, for the future. Um, but there was no reason uh, to, to miss it other than I didn't have time to cover it, uh, Kevin. It was Kevin, I think you answered it was asked that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, brilliant. So there is another question from uh, Muriel uh, McClatchy. So there is, she says, it's see, uh, do you want to ask it yourself or? Uh, no, you go we... for it. You go for it. Uh, so it seems that plants uh, played an important role in activities at the site over millennia. I know Mick Monk did a small amount of work on the plant remains years ago. Are there plans uh, for a more comprehensive, uh, comprehensive investigation? Uh, thanks very much, Mariel. There are not necessarily plans yet, but ambitions. And, you know, we, it's very difficult to find uh, an expert who deals with this material and somebody who's uh, available and um, will be knocking on your door uh, at some stage. Yes, Mick Monk did a small amount of work and there is some work going on on, on sort of parallel aspects. So as you probably know, your colleague Steve Davis is, is looking at some of the insect remains, but in preparing and processing those samples, uh, I think he's finding some things that might be of interest to you. Uh, and we plan to get some dating work done. Uh, Lauren O'Donnell is hopefully going to look at some of the charcoal samples that we've got as well. Um, but this is one of our one of our priorities for uh, for future work. Thanks, Mario. What this email space? Amazing. So this is all the questions I had uh, <laughs> in the chat box. Uh, has anyone oh, else uh, got a question? You missed Could a question I join in? Dempsey. Yeah. You missed a question from Karen Dempsey. Upwards above Marin Dial. <laughs> Oh yeah, sorry, sorry, excuse me. Um, so do you want to, uh, Karen Dempsey, do you want to ask it yourself or shall I read it out? Uh, so I will uh, read it out. Oh, oh, sorry. Hi, Hi go. thanks a million. Um, I was just really interested in what you were saying about the 30 years for the houses. And I wonder, do you think there's something connected to the generations of, or the life course in relation to the the changing of the house or, or, or the multiple uses or whatever. Yeah, I think that's a, a very interesting observation, Karen. And it's the sort of thing that's impossible, I think, to get empirical evidence for, but there's certainly enough um, uh, circumstantial evidence in terms of there being six phases within a 200 year period. And for this uh, time period, we'd roughly estimate there'd be six generations within a, within a 200 year time period. And while the 
material that the houses was built from was organic and decayed over time, particularly in a waterlogged location like that. It also, I think, is more than a coincidence that um, that every new generation perhaps took the opportunity to rebuild uh, in the same way, I suppose, even in our own time that, uh, you know, a young generation taking over from their parents adds an extension to the house or redoes the roof or, you know, um, I, I certainly see something like that. And, and that is something that we would like to discuss in, in our interpretations. Uh, but I think, unless you can think of a, of a way of actually finding hard physical evidence that yes, a new generation takes over uh, and, Traditionally, they uh, will burn down or pull out the, the stakes around the house and replace them with new ones. I think it would be just circumstantial, but it's a it's a really good observation, I think, also in the light of the work that was being done at the in Ferry Carrig. I'm, I'm going to, if you don't mind, uh, Michael, I'm going to disagree with you and I'm going to disagree with John. Um, so John, when he was basically established uh, the phasing at Minor Lock, went on the basis of uh, the diagnostic finds. Um, so he stretched his his phases. Uh, you know, he he got a seventh century date or an eighth century date. Now this is just my opinion. I, I might be proven wrong, obviously. Um, so John was taking thinking quite traditionally in terms of of um, uh, uh, kind of long term occupation of a crown of without breaks. Um, the the dendrochronological work done at places like Loch Lashen um, uh, and uh, Boston crown in Scotland and so on. Uh, it looks like there are many chronologies. The chronology is much more choppy and much more staggered. Um, uh, um, so, for example, at, at Boston, you're looking at a 10 year occupation of a house uh, and uh, abandonment for five, coming back, repairing, building again for eight. Um, the, the construction of the big 11.2 meter uh, house was a, an artistic reconstruction by John's uh, illustrator. Um, but if you look at the, the the house in terms of the archaeological evidence and look at the house in terms of the one that Brendan built up at CMAC, um, the house at, at Minor Lock couldn't have lasted longer than about eight years, ten years. Um, that post and wattle is, would be uh, in a punishingly uh, bad environment. Uh, wetting and drying of hazel is disastrous. Um, so you could be looking at event-based activities where a house like that is built for feasting. Um, is occupied, is used for 10 years, and then it basically collapses and, and they do stuff again. The, the, the chronology um, could be an awful lot trickier than that. And I think the idea that a house like that would last a lifetime, it, it, that doesn't hold water, um, not in those conditions and not of that material. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I think there could be, uh, it might be very hard to find it out now, but I think the the, the the occupation and the, the use of wooden structures on a, on a wetland site uh, uh, could be a lot um, a lot more rapid than we might have thought before, well, than John would have thought back in the day. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I, thanks, Aidan. I think that it'll be very interesting to get um, a much more, uh, a much fuller picture in terms of the radiocarbon dates, because, you know, John back then and even still now, we're, we're basing a lot of our interpretation on a very small number of, of dates. Uh, six for the entire site. So um, I'm hopefully going to get funding for another 40 next year. And I think that will help us address some of these issues. I mean, still, we're going to be in the dark about a lot of it, but those observations are, are very helpful, Aidan. Thank you. Make sure to inc include them in uh, your book part of it, uh, you know, your, your volume. Um, it's nearly finished, is it? Okay, thanks, Aidan. Amazing. Has, has anyone uh, had more questions? Could, Michael, could I make a comment? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, whoever that is, absolutely. Yeah, it's Fiona Ogan speaking. Hi, Fiona. Hi, Michael. Just want to um, congratulate you. And um, I know I can speak on behalf of George to say how very delighted he would be to know that the work is so advanced and in such good hands and such a multidisciplinary team as well. So well done to one and all, and especially you, Michael. I really enjoyed the lecture and oh. uh, brought, brought back great memories too. <laughs> Thanks very so, much, Fiona. Yeah. I, I wasn't aware that you were there. It's, I'm delighted yeah. that you were, and please yeah. give my very best wishes to George. He was, I will. And, yeah. and still is yeah, a great I'll supporter of the site. Later. 
yeah, Great. it'll be good news from. Thanks, oh, Michael. thank you. Wonderful. Best news I've had all day. I, I'm going to follow that up by saying that I was actually, I visited um, in 1987 uh, out from Nouse with Professor Ogan. So it brings back very happy memories. Um, Thanks, Joe. I just wanted to ask, uh, obviously there were all those quernstones in the late Bronze Age layer, um, and 20 quernstones is more than, you know, a single household or even, you know, three households or whatever you might imagine if this was kind of a settlement um, would have needed. I was wondering, um, was there much animal bone from the late Bronze Age context? I'm just thinking, you know, maybe this was some kind of a place where larger, you know, a community, larger numbers of people came together. And in that context, I suppose the, the sort of high status objects, um, you know, if you're meeting with your, your friends or your, your neighbors or your, your kinsfolk or whatever for a festival, you want to, to wear your best stuff. Yeah, uh, thanks Joe. And thanks for the, the, the comments earlier too. Um, yeah, some of those quernstones are actually in UCD. So you can go and have a look at them yourself. Just tell, get Connor to show you where they are. Um, yeah, the, the, there is quite a lot of animal bone from the late Bronze Age level, but nothing like there is from the early medieval period. Uh, there's a lot of stone and a lot of broken stone brought in and quite a lot of the, the majority of the quern stones are, are broken as well. So it's not possible to know in most cases if they were brought in simply as a stone resource, having been used, made used and, and broken elsewhere. And that might explain why some of them were brought in. They were already broken and, and waste and just part of the foundation material for the late Bronze Age houses. But having said that, uh, the, the sheer number of them suggests that either on the site or nearby on the shore, a lot of grain was being ground. Um, and the, the full context of that, I think, is, well, yet to be found out. So I'd be interested in your own uh, opinion and comment on that in, in, in due course, Joanna. Just to add a small comparator there, uh, the Clonfinlock site, again, saddle querns distributed around domestic structures in nearly all cases, uh, though we didn't find uh, or at least recognised direct evidence for grain, but corn stones and rubbing stones were scattered around. Um, and I think Cathy Moore has been identifying in other contexts that uh, corn stones are beginning to show up in wet contexts where people aren't living. So uh, the story might be a little more complex than we thought. Thanks, Connor. I think that the other thing to, to remind ourselves here is that the, the very high status nature of some of the late Bronze Age material, um, not casually uh, lost, uh, nor uh, it appears deliberately deposited as might one might expect perhaps in the lake uh, around the settlement site itself. Uh, but certainly there were high status people there, but I might just refer back to what Joanna herself said and, and Fiona beforehand, uh, having visited Monia Lock on many occasions during the excavations, I have no memory of it whatsoever because of the huge quantity of alcohol that was being consumed. <laughs> so perhaps that was what was happening back in the late Bronze Age. People were losing their belongings in the befuddled uh, state they were in um, after a visit to the site. Uh, Owen, very good. Michael, I wonder if I could ask you a question. Uh, hi, Stephen. First of all, hi there. Great, very good to see you. And it's it's great to, to, to be able to join in from, from, from Glasgow. But unfortunately, my... my my internet went slightly wobbly when you were talking about the early medieval periods. So if I've, you've answered this, then I apologize. I'm somebody else who worked at Munya and I spent the summer of 1989 digging there. Um, and I was working at the southern edge of the site and there was a belief at the time or the possibility that there, there had been a major slippage event in the early, middle, in the early medieval period and part of the crano had actually broken away. Um, but we were trying to find the evidence to demonstrate that and never actually followed through and got conclusive evidence or evidence to tie it into any of the phasing. I was just one, wondering, was it, did anything ever, I never spoke to John about it again, just other things always kind of slipped my mind. Did, did anything ever come of that theory or did it ever get linked into a specific phase or abandonment event or anything like that? Thanks very much, Stephen, and great to see you. Your name crops up on various of the notebooks and things for, for Munya as well. Um, yeah, something did come of that, and was it was that the 
suggestion or interpretation of major slippage was probably exaggerated, that uh, there had clearly been some, some uh, slippage of the site in the late early medieval period that uh, had caused some, some damage, but that it was nothing as uh, major as John had initially interpreted. And that a lot of the complicated stratigraphy on that particular part of the site was related to, well, 1970s rather than the 770s. It was a, night, it was a nightmare. It was one of the most complicated trenches I've ever worked in. But Yeah, um... uh, and, and at that stage, one of the, uh, you know, explanations of that, that complex stratigraphy was some form of slippage in, in antiquity. And, um, and I, I think it's, it's much more difficult to corroborate that now. Thank you, and it's a great project. Congratulations. No, oh, thanks very much. Um, thank you very much. So uh, I have here a comment from uh, Muriel uh, uh, McClatchy. She says, happy to recommend people. So I suppose it's for the plant. Uh, <laughs> remain uh, research. Uh, then uh, Brendan O'Neill says, thank you so much, uh, Michael. Excellent presentation. And then I have a last question because I then I have to run, sorry guys, uh, from Louise uh, McNally. And uh, Louise, would you like to ask it yourself? Yeah, I can. Um, thank you for that. Sorry, uh, <laughs> it's very early in the morning over here on the other side of the world. So excuse the croaky throat and very dark atmosphere. I'm not trying to be Halloween gloomy. Um, thank you, Michael. It's been absolutely fantastic to be able to tune in. And I think we have this um, <laughs> horrible happenstance around the pandemic to thank for opportunities like this. So thank you all and, and specifically you. Um, my, my research, which is hobby only, <laughs> no professional by or, or educated by any means, but um, from in terms of textile production, I'm wondering if there's any sort of further evidence across any levels on the site. You mentioned, I think, a bone well um, very early in the piece, but um, it, <laughs> I suppose it's a matter of for me of thinking about um, is it worth looking further into the the reports that might be available from this particular location for any further evidence of textile production. Thanks, Louise. Um, good day. Uh, it's good. Good to see you. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, there is. There's quite a few uh, spindle whorls, in fact, uh, bone and uh, stone. I can look through the various databases later on, and and send you a list of them, and you can decide whether you'd you'd like to, you know, inquire further about them at that stage. There are also some pieces of textile. From the site now of course there's no way of knowing if though if that textile was produced on the site it was certainly worn and probably lost on the site um but a close analysis of that remains to be done um it, it, almost certainly given the range of crafts and activities represented almost certainly some uh, textile production was carried out on site uh, there's some evidence for leather working as well uh, mm. so so yeah the, in terms of the the artifacts um, and in terms of the sheep bones that are there, you know, and the suggested evidence that there's uh, obviously wool available, uh, and then mm -hmm. the textiles themselves. There's, there's a good range, and I think there would be a, a nice little study there as well, um, if, if, if you're interested. Absolutely interested. I'll, I'll yeah. start to look okay. a bit further, so thank uh, you. Okay, well, perhaps we can be in touch by email. Terrific. Thanks, Louise. Good stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much guys, all of you uh, who joined us today uh, for this amazing uh, seminar. Uh, it was 79 people, 80 people at the most uh, part, uh, so I'm, I'm uh, delighted. Uh, thank you uh, so much Michael for this brilliant uh, presentation and just amazing, amazing sight. Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, accepting again <laughs> our invitation. It, it was great. Uh, enjoyed it very much. So, yeah. Thanks very uh, much. Thanks very much yourself. indeed. Well done for organizing it. And thanks to everybody for coming along. I, I know that it's the site and, uh, and for John that you tuned in. Um, but I'm particularly grateful, uh, particularly those of you who've stayed all the time until now. So hopefully we'll have lots more to report in the future. And who knows, maybe we'll be back uh, next year or in a couple of years.
update you. Uh, thanks very much for the various suggestions and the questions. And maybe uh, anybody who has uh, suggestions like Muriel of, of people uh, who might be able to uh, contribute in some way in terms of analysis, maybe send me an email later. Okay, enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you very again. much. Thank you, guys. Have a great evening. Take care, all of you. Mind yourself.